Good luck time, everyone. I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's digital minister in charge of social innovation. Tokyo Tourism Daigaku no minasan, konnichiwa. Taiwan no digital tanto daiji no Audrey Tang desu. It is my great pleasure and honor to be here as one of the speakers of the Global Leader Series at the Tokyo Metropolitan University. I was told that the TMU is the only public university founded by the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. It's one of the top research universities in Japan, well, in the world. So first of all, I want to say congratulations to you all. You must have worked so hard to enter this university, and each of you should feel very proud now. As many part of the world has endured more than one year of closures, lockdowns, and other pandemic restrictions, all countries around the world are now scratching their heads to find a way to reinvigorate our economy and to, if not return to normal, at least create a new normal. Many obstacles do remain, though, and there is a long way to go. But I believe that democracy is the most effective form of technology. It's a social technology with which we can tackle the biggest global crisis of our time. I believe that to give no trust is to get no trust, and we must overcome the infodemic and the pandemic by promoting participation and people-public-private partnerships. In other words, it takes all hands on deck to bring about change, and each one of us is part of the solution. In the following video, I will share with you some of our ideas about digital social innovation, about how we can use digital technology to foster social innovation. I'll share the Taiwan model against the epidemic, empowering the social sector to collaborate with the public and private sectors. The video was recorded a few months ago, However, the principles still apply today. At the end of the film, I will be back with you and answer some excellent questions that I have recently received from the TMU. Hopefully, I will be able to provide some inspirations for you to co-create a better future together. Enjoy! Hello, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister. I'm really happy to be here virtually to share with you how Taiwan countered the pandemic with no lockdowns, and how we counter the infodemic with no takedowns. But first, I would like to say that social innovation, that is to say, the people who trust each other to innovate on how to improve as we encounter a novel situation, a novel coronavirus in this case, is really the cornerstone of Taiwan's collective intelligence. In Taiwan, we have the fast fair, fun, as the three pillars of social innovation. I'd like to talk first about the fast part. Democracy improves as more people participate, and digital technology remains one of the best ways to improve participation, as long as the focus is on listening at scale, not just broadcasting, and finding common ground and rough consensus rather than sowing discord. So whereas many economies began countering the coronavirus only this year, in Taiwan, we started last year. And we thank Dr. Li Wenliang from Wuhan, the whistleblower who posted that there were seven new SARS cases last year. In the Taiwanese equivalent of Reddit, the PTT, there's someone with the name No More Pipe reposting Dr. Li Wenliang's message on an early morning of December 31st, and it got upvoted so that our medical officers immediately noticed this post and issued an order that says all passengers flying in from Wuhan to Taiwan need to start health inspections, and that was the first day of 2020. It says to me two things. First, the civil society trusts each other and the government enough to talk about possible new SARS cases in a public forum, and that the government trusts the citizens enough to take it seriously and treat it as if SARS has happened again. It's something that we have been always preparing since 2003. And the reason of this trust is because, according to the Civicus Monitor, the Human Rights Watch Group, Taiwan is the most open, indeed the only completely open society in the whole of Asia. 
We enjoy the same freedom of speech, the same freedom of assembly, the same freedom of the press, and so on as other liberal democratic countries, but with the emphasis on keeping an open mind on novel technologies, because in Taiwan, democracy itself is a technology. We only got to direct presidential election thanks to the late President Li Denghui in 1996. And there's a saying that anything that's invented after we're born is technology. So in Taiwan, we're constantly looking at ways to improve democracy as a set of social technologies. One example. Every day, our Central Epidemic Command Center during the pandemic holds a live streamed press conference. And the simple collective intelligence system in this case is a toll-free number that is 1922. Anyone with any idea coming in from the civil society can just pick up their phone and dial this number. Not only there's more than 90% chance of it getting picked up, um, you can actually ask anything about epidemiology as well as contributing your thoughts to the CECC daily press conference. For example, there was one day in April when a young boy's family called saying, hey, my boy doesn't want to go to school because their schoolmates may laugh at him for wearing a pink medical mask. You see, when you're rationing mask, you don't get to pick the color. Well, the very next day, everybody in the CUCC press conference started wearing pink medical mask, making sure that everybody learns about gender mainstreaming. And a person in the middle, um, Minister Chen Shizhong, our commander, even said that his favorite childhood icon was the pink panther. And this kind of fast response builds trust between the government and the civil society. Another focus here is fairness. For example, when we ramped up the facial mask production, making sure that everybody can use their national health insurance card to collect masks from nearby pharmacies, fairness is the guiding principle. But the system to distribute the mask was not a government technology project. In the beginning, it's a GovZero project. In Taiwan, for each government website that always ends in something that gov.tw, for example, our national participation portal uh, is join.gov.tw, the civil society, the civic hackers, can always change the domain name from the O to a zero. So once you do this change in your browser bar, you get into the shadow government that uses the same data, the same ideas, but take it to a different direction. And we call it forking the government. Important pronunciation, fork the government. Fork means not erasing what's already there, but taking it to a new exciting direction. And because the GovZero movement always relinquish the copyright of the um, work, actually mostly using the MIT license, people can very easily change that source code also to try different variations. And at the end, if there's something that's uh, really liked by the general public, the government can always take it in. One example is that there is this map that was created by Howard Wu or Wu Jiangwei from Tainan City. In early February, he observed that when people go to the nearby stores for mask purchase, there's no telling which store runs out of masks and which store still have them in stock. So instead of relying on social media, uh, which may not be uh, up to date uh, and also is quite chaotic, he created uh, this map similar to the Ushahidi map where people can voluntarily report uh, which convenience stores, uh, which pharmacies uh, near their places still have masks or whether they run out of masks. The only problem about this is that, um, well, because he used the Google API, soon um, the API usage uh, is astronomically high, so he cannot afford to run it anymore. So he joined um, the GovZero movement's Slack channel, asking, uh, are there better ways um, to cache the result or to use OpenStreetMap or use some other technology to uh, relieve uh, him of the budget burden? 
Now I'm one of the people in the GovZero Slack channel that contributed to the discussion. And it occurred to me that this system is much better than the system that we posted online from the government side about the availability of masks. So I just went to the premier, Su Jun Chang, saying, hey, this young person here has a much better idea of how to visualize the mask availability, and we need to do all we can to support him. And this is what I call reverse procurement. In traditional procurement, the government sets the specification and the citizens, the economic sector, implements it. But here, the social sector sets the expectation, the specification. The economic sector, such as Google, eventually waived the API usage fees. And at the end, the public sector's role is just to implement what the social and economic sector wants in a way of realizing the real-time API of our National Health Insurance Agency to make sure that everybody gets access to the level of mask availability in each pharmacy. There were more than 6,000 of them every 30 seconds. And that's why people can participate in accountability when they're queuing in line. Everybody can look at the map or the chatbot or voice assistance. There's more than 100 different applications of the same open data in API form. And if they um, swipe their NHI card and go to a pharmacy who shows at this moment uh, 58 adult masks available, um, then they would expect that after the uh, person before them uh, swipe their NHI card and collect nine medical masks, then uh, 58 minus nine, um, that would be 49. And so um, everybody would then expect that this sort of like distributed ledger, because each uh, map visualization, each toolkits provider have a copy uh, of the real-time API um, to be consistent. But if instead it doesn't go to 49, but go to, I don't know, 60 or something, uh, they will call 1922 right there. And so this participatory accountability makes sure that a pharmacist uh, earn the trust by opening up their real-time stock uh, and the civil society earn each other's trust by making sure that each transaction is indeed fair. And because the NHI, the National Health Insurance, covers more than 99.99% of not just citizens but also residents, people who show any symptoms will then be able to take the medical mask, go to a local clinic, knowing that they will get treated fairly and without incurring any financial or social burden. And this also enabled the civil society to build dashboards. In this dashboard, we see that we're uh, indeed ramping up the medical mass production. This is the uh, point where we uh, switched from uh, distributing three masks uh, for adults per week um, to nine medical masks per two weeks. And so, um, the supply is indeed growing and people can see it in real time. And there's also people who analyze this and shows us where in Taiwan do we have a oversupply or undersupply. And the pharmacist also uh, has real-time feedback on the kind of supply levels and the people's queuing behavior and so on. And they can always report it in the real time so that their received supplies as well as the ordering system is always co-created with the entire society. And based on this analysis, uh, we saw that even though that we reached about 75% of people collecting medical masks and using it regularly, um, the numeric model shows uh, us that to uh, reduce the R0 value to be uh, under one, it's not enough to only have like 70% of people actually wearing the mask. We need to get to more than 75%, uh, ideally 80%, so that the R value will be under one. So we asked the remaining one quarter of population and um, based on the dashboard and the focus group, they told us that many people who work uh, in the science parks, like near the Taiwan Semiconductor Company um, in Xinzhou uh, or uh, in the financial sectors uh, in the Taipei or New Taipei cities, they work very long hours, uh, actually a longer working hour than the pharmacist. And so before, when we only rationed through the 6,000 pharmacies, 
they could miss the mask um, collection simply because, well, after they went off work, everybody from the pharmacies have already um, went home. And so uh, we need to ensure fairness of all kinds. And that's when we started uh, in early March to work with convenience stores, which opens 24 hours a day. And we use the NHI app, which can validate that you are indeed the person uh, that registered in the NHI using the mobile provider's um, TWID um, identification so that you can authorize that app, um, the access to your SIM card. And if your SIM card is registered to your name and it matches your NHI card, then you can use that app as your NHI card and pre-order the mask to your nearby convenience store. And so you see our premier, Su Zhen Chang, smiling very happily here. And that's because that's the day we started working with convenience stores. And because um, the convenience stores also served many people, um, there's more than 12,000 of convenience stores. And then they also joined this co-creation, telling us that uh, even though that this moved um, the mask availability well above 80%, there's still like 10% or so who could not access the service, either because they do not have a mobile phone, um, like they're uh, of the very elderly and they could not queue in the pharmacy either, or um, maybe they're um, migrant workers who do have a national health insurance card, but do not have the mobile phone to their name. Maybe they use prepaid SIMs and so on. And so um, in early April, we further improved the system so that anyone with the NHI card can just go to any kiosk in their nearby convenience store, insert the NHI card to pre-order to the same convenience store to collect it a week afterwards. And that's when we um, distribute the mask to more than 95% of the population. And so we ensure fairness of all kinds. And I would also like to share the fun part in fast, fair, and fun. Because this is a stressful time and people do feel anxious. There was a lot of panic buying, a lot of conspiracy theories. And in Taiwan, our counter disinformation strategy it's based on this simple idea. It's called humor over rumor. One example, when there was panic buying of tissue papers, there was a rumor that says, and I quote, there is uh, a same material of the medical mask that's being um, produced in the tissue paper factories. And they, these were being rationed out to the medical mask production facility, so we will very soon run out of tissue papers." Unquote. Of course, that's not true. The tissue papers and the medical masks are not of the same material. But because this travels out outrage, um, it maybe has a R value of three, like every hour, uh, on average, each person would share to three uh, people on social media. And so there was panic buying. And the same premier you saw smiling in the previous slide, after not even two hours, wrote this meme out. And in this internet meme, in this picture, um, the Premier Su Zhen Chang shows his backside, wiggles his bottom a little bit, and say in very large print, each of us only have one pair of Botox. And it's a wordplay, because in Mandarin, uh, tun to stockpile sounds the same as tun uh, Botox. Um, and so um, this is, of course, hilarious. Many people laughed about it. Um, and because this travels on joy, uh, on humor, uh, it has maybe a R value of five. Um, so even if this rolls out after the original conspiracy theory, after a day or two, this reached more people. And there's also a table here that says, um, you know, the tissue papers came from South American materials but then the medical mask came from domestic materials. So they're completely different. There is no need to panic buy. And of course, people who laughed about this specific meme is literally unable to feel outrage because well, that they've laughed about it and the fact checking can then uh, enter the effect. And so we finally found out the people who spread the conspiracy theory in the first place and they were tissue paper resellers. Uh, anyway, this was not just a single shot point uh, in the social media. This kind of uh, vaccination um, of the mind is very important in our CECC daily press conference as well. 
You see, in each ministry, there is、uh, a team of what we call participation officers or POs. Just like media officer that talks to the journalist and the parliamentary officer that talk to the MPs, the、uh, participation officers talk to hashtags. Whenever there's a trending, emerging hashtag such as the conspiracy theory about tissue papers, the participation officers need to engage the hashtag instead of inviting the representative. There's no representative for most hashtags. One would just join, engage the hashtag. Um, and to share hilarious memes that always is inviting, and make sure that scientific、uh, humor, the clarification, spreads easier and wider, and invites people to co-create it. And so, our Ministry of Health and Welfare's participation officer lives with this dog, this Shiba Inu,、um, and the name is Zong Chai, or the dog CEO, that translates the physical distancing signs.、Um, On the、uh, top left corner,、uh, for example, if you're outdoor, you have to keep two Shiba Inu away from one another. If you're indoor, you need to keep three dogs away from each other. Or the sanitation,、um, hand sanitation, important.、Uh, remember to cover your mouth and nose when sneezing. Don't do what this、um, dog does.、Uh, or remember to pre-order your mask. But why don't um, you um, just um, wear the mask? Uh, because wearing a mask is not very useful unless you also wash your hands with soap, and so、um, we always connect the two memes together. And so you order the mask in order to protect you from your own unwashed hands. And this is what this picture is saying:、uh, like、um, the mask is here to protect you from your own hands,、um, and please use a soap to wash your hands much more diligently. And so. That's how we make sure that Taiwanese people still feel calm and collected, even during the pandemic. So this is the pandemic part, and now,、uh, based on this humor over rumor idea, I would like to talk a little bit about the infodemic part. In Taiwan, we ensure that there's always timely response from rumor to humor.、Um, on average, each ministry. Can now produce such memes under an hour or so. The maximum is two hours. We have the triple two rule that says whenever there's a trending、um, disinformation that's intentional public harm or just misinformation that people were misinformed, regardless if this is something that a minister can clarify, then we need to clarify it at most after two hours, and with two pictures. With less than two hundred characters, and this so that it can fit the screen on a mobile phone, making sure that even though it's two hours later,、uh, we can have a higher R value that travels on joy rather than something that travels on outrage and that can vaccinate against the outrage. So one example, so you see、uh, Premier Su Jinchang, and now you see another picture of him when he was young. This was made. To counter a rumor that says, and I quote, "Perming your hair will be subject to one million dollar fine starting next week if you do it more than once a week." Unquote. Now, of course, this would travel an outrage, and so very quickly,、um, the premier rolls this out that says it's not true, and not only it's not true. This part says, even though I may be bald now, I will not punish people who look like my youth. And this part, the fine print says, what we have introduced is a labeling requirement for hair products, and that only takes effect starting 2021. However, the fun part is here. The premier,、uh, as he looks now, says, however, if you keep perming your hair many times a week, even though there's no fine, your hair will be not so fine. Just look at me、uh, for what may happen to you. Now again, this is very humorous,、uh, and he makes fun of not other people but himself. And so, this kind of humor appeals to all age groups, all pe- people with all different political affiliations, and so on,、uh, who consider this hilarious always.、Um, and so, very quickly, if you search on search engine or social media or trending hashtags,、um, you see this clarification rather than the 
misinformation. So response, comedic response um, in real time, that is very important. Now, of course, people may ask, so how did you discover what is trending? It, because people uh, who share something like misinformation or people who deliberately sow discord or disinformation don't always have a higher than one R value. Uh, and if they don't, well, it won't go viral. And if it doesn't go viral, it doesn't make sense for us you know, to keep responding to each one. So how to tell the R value of the mimetic virus um, from very early on? Well, again, we rely on collective intelligence. In Taiwan, there's a lot of communities, such as the COFAX community, which is also a GAV0, a G0V project that works very diligently to look at the end-to-end -end encrypted channels that's like uh, Line or WhatsApp. And people, of course, uh, it's end-to-end -end encrypted, so only the people who receive the message uh, can see it, but they can dedicate, they can donate, that is to say forward that message to the bot, to the COFAX bot. And um, in the economic sector, Trend Micro, Taiwan's leading antivirus company, also provides a doctor message bot. But whichever bot uh, you trust, uh, at the end, all the uh, disinformation or misinformation packages forwarded to the bot uh, will be published um, like a spam house, a clearing house for email spam and sent to the international fact-checking network, a set of journalistic organizations that works on fact-checking. And just like spam house may rate each incoming sender's um, signature as spam or not spam. And if it's spam, of course, it goes into the junk mail folder uh, rather than our inbox. The IFCN also publishes publicly the reports about fact-checking of the most trending rumors. And so the COFAC or Dr. Message uh, line bot works with the Taiwan Fact Check Center, um, MigoPen, many of them are part of this uh, international fact checking network. And so we work um, in an international setting, making sure that it's professional journalists, not um, civil servants doing the fact checking. The civil service uh, nevertheless can provide the real time access for the fact checkers. And when the fact checkers publish it, we can also help to make it more funny. Um, and so this uh, symbiotic relationship puts the power of fact-checking ultimately to the journalism and to uh, people who run the internet governance um, systems of multi-stakeholder discussions uh, rather than relying on any specific law. In Taiwan, we never um, passed any law about spawn management. All we did was uh, working through the social norms, making sure that this multi-stakeholder setting um, convinces every uh, internet platforms is that it really is in everybody's best interest to introduce flagging as spam and the spam house protocols. And the same goes for disinformation and um, the discovery of it. Now, of course, um, as election draws near in any uh, jurisdiction, the level of intentional disinformation grows it's not uh, just unintentional misinformation anymore because this information has this um, capability to mobilize people in their outrage to um, motivate political behavior. And in Taiwan, um, we witnessed that in the 2018 mayoral election, there were a lot of precision targeted um, advertisements, um, so-called dark patterns, um, that target specific population and lead them to believe um, untrue things uh, that would then discourage them to vote or to um, make uh, them see um, certain politicians and so on, or even the democratic process itself, the voting process itself, um, as not trustworthy. And so um, we can't have that, especially when we see many of the advertisement money um, in that case were paid outside of our jurisdiction. Uh, and that uh, is interference in the election. And so um, in 2018, that's also the first year that our control branch, the control yuan, which is a separate government branch from the administration and legislation, um, published the, their audit reports of the campaign donation and expenditure for the first time as open data. So all of them uh, as raw data has uh, each incoming and each outgoing 
finance declaration of the electoral campaign of all the mayoral and city councilor um, candidates, and notably missing in those um, records are social media advertisements. And so then we talked to Facebook, um, to Google, to the social media companies saying, look, um, you have two choices. Either you can work with our new norm, the control your norm, and publish in real time as open data, structured raw data of your advertisement library of all the social political advertisements paid um, targeting Taiwanese people during our election season. Or, well, you may face social sanction. So again, we did not rely on any specific law. We just convinced uh, that the uh, multinational companies, uh, as well as our domestic platforms, such as PTT, that it really is in everybody's interest. If we work with the control your norms, that norm, by the way, uh, was uh, made into existence by an act of civil disobedience from the Gov Zero people um, who went to the control yuan, um, asked for photocopies because that was the only form available before 2018, uh, and run this crowdsource OCR campaign like a CAPTCHA uh, and publish these um, in a kind of guerrilla way. Um, and the control yuan, of course, said uh, you can't be sure that all these OCR, otaku uh, character recognition are correct. And the Gov Zero said, well, you need to publish the really correct data then. Uh, and of course, they started doing so last year. So um, because of this uh, mandate from the social sector and the collaboration from the public sector, people this time in the economic sector, Facebook and so on, uh, finally agreed that for the presidential election uh, this year, um, they published all the uh, political social media advertisements and they also banned foreign sponsored um, propaganda, that is to say, uh, targeted advertisement uh, on their platform. And Google and Twitter simply refused to run um, such um, advertisement during our election season. So that was a success. And so here, again, investigative journalism is uh, paramount. The Reader Plus, uh, for example, used this kind of open data to connect the MPs and the campaign donors roster. And in real time, if any MP uh, candidates try any dark pattern uh, like we saw in the mayoral election, well, they would get discovered, publicly shamed uh, within a couple of hours, I'm sure. And so because of that, nobody tried that um, in our uh, pre previous presidential election. And so it was very successful. So now I'm going to share uh, with you like three actual disinformation or misinformation. Uh, actually, I think these are all disinformation um, that uh, illustrates our uh, counter infodemic principles. And <clears throat> again, I must uh, stress that there is no administrative takedown. In Taiwan, a journalist's word is worth exactly the same as a minister's word. Uh, and so nothing in the administration can force a journalist or indeed anyone on social media um, to change uh, what they have said uh, or to take it down. However, we can attribute it publicly. So one of the examples that you see here um, is the uh, 204 uh, report of the Thailand Fact Check Center. And it says, and I quote, Hong Kong sucks compensation exposed killing a police, earning you up to 20 million. And this was posted um, in 2019, uh, around November, at the heat of our presidential election. And why would that uh, disinformation campaign occur? That was because that was the single most important issue in our presidential election, about whether we support people fighting for democracy in Hong Kong, or whether we distance from them. Now, if you look on the left-hand side, this disinformation payload actually use a legit photo. And the photo here is from Reuters that says, a teenage uh, extradition bill protester is seen uh, during a march uh, to um, demand democracy and political reform in Hong Kong, China. However, the version that spreads in the Taiwanese social media has a different caption, even though it's the same photo. And it says, and I quote, this 13-year-old thug bought new iPhones, 
game consoles, brand names for shoes, etc., and he is recruiting his younger brothers." Unquote. And so, obviously, this is a、um, repackaging to、um, make Taiwanese people feel more distant、uh, from the people in Hong Kong. But as I said, we cannot do a administrative takedown, and because of that, we work with the social media companies. And、I'm happy to see that Twitter、uh, is now also joining.、Uh, but at the time, Facebook, for example, would post this public notice to all people who share this、uh, on the social media if they use the right-hand side picture. And the、um, public notice simply said that please read the Taiwan Fact Check Center's report that traced the original poster of this new caption、uh, to Zhong Yang Zheng Fa Wei Chang An Jian. Which is the political and law unit of the PRC's、um, political and law unit, and so that's it. Like they, of course, still enjoy freedom of speech、um, in Taiwanese social media. We just want to make sure that Taiwanese people are aware、um, that this new caption was not authored by Reuters or a journalist, but rather authored、uh, on the Weibo account of the Zhong Yang Zheng Fawei Chang An Jian, and, and so that's. The idea of a notice and public notice. Another、uh, case in point.、Um, so during the voting for the presidential election, there was again a、um, disinformation that says, and I quote: "The CIA made two special invisible ink for ballots, so no matter how you vote, Tsai always wins." Unquote. The idea is that if you vote. For someone else, the ink you use will slowly disappear, and、uh, another invisible ink in Tsai's place will magically appear. Now, how to counter this disinformation? Well, again, we worked with the civil society on collective intelligence and radical transparency, because in Taiwan, the ballots when these are counted,、uh, we don't have e-ballots for our presidential election. We have them for i voting and some participatory budgeting, but not for voting for people.、Uh, and so, when these、uh, ballots are being taken out from the counting ballot box,、um, actually, the people who、uh, help the elections、uh, are allowed to film it from the seats、uh, of the election watch. And so, many popular YouTubers joined their local、uh, counting process,、uh, where the counter、uh, will just. Show each ballot to each angle, so that the YouTubers、um, have plenty of footage, and they have their own tallying app, as you can see on the top left corner,、um, that、um, emphasizes the importance of democracy as a social participation、um, ritual. Really, <laughs> that makes sure that people can trust each and every vote. So if there are invisible、uh, ink, or if there are ballots with this suddenly disappearing、um, ink, of course it will very quickly get notified uh, by um, the uh, party candidates、um, into all the counters、um, that the all the YouTubers、um, in the counting stations. And of course, after receiving the notification from their app, they will of, co- of course look specifically for it, and that's what happened. And even though, like many people, look for it, nothing like that、uh, ever happened. And so, no matter which president candidate do people vote for, they can see before their own eyes or through a YouTuber that they trust that the counting process is indeed fair, and there's no invisible ink one way or another. Again, radical transparency as a way to earn trust and participatory accountability in the form of broadcasting. Directly from the counting stations. Um, finally, uh, the third that I would like to share with you. So, when Howard Wu was rolling out the mask map, on the very same day,、um, there was this rumor that says, "Now, even with money, people cannot buy medical mask now." And I quote, "This manufacturer sponsored two thousand boxes of mask. Get a box for free." By sharing this post and increasing the R value,、um, of course, people who share this、uh, message did not get medical mask, but they get phishing emails. That is to say, they get、uh, cybersecurity threats、um, and virus 
instead of uh, medical masks. And again, um, the way to fix this problem is not by taking down such conspiracy theories because these are just symptoms. The way we counter it is on the very first day of the medical mask rationing system through the National Health Insurance Agency, we made sure that people can access it through the chatbots, such as the Ji Guan Jia, the Center for Disease Control chatbot that has more than, I think, 2 million uh, people using it on the very first day. Uh, and altogether, on the first week, these tools reach more than half of population. And each of them who saw this um, mask availability is then immune to the kind of phishing um, conspiracy theories uh, about a random manufacturer, um, you know, trading your uh, private information details uh, to the promise of the medical mask that never delivers. Rather, this one always delivers. And because everybody have a national health insurance card, they can also check the availability themselves by asking the pharmacist and so on. And so again, participatory accountability through essentially a distributed ledger technology make sure that everybody feels calm and also collect it. And here is again the dashboard at the time. So um, to counter this information, I think this is important that we look at it also from a epidemiologic perspective, that we need to achieve universal health coverage, making sure that everybody gets educated in the way of not media literacy, but media competence making sure that people can contribute to the fact-checking leading to the presidential platform or uh, debate. Um, there's thousands of people who work with institutional media as kind of amateur volunteer media um, in fact-checking. And we need to support such as COFACT and Dr. Message and Michael Penn and Taiwan Fact uh, Check Center and so on uh, in the research and development to the affordable vaccination, that is to say the fact-checking report, how to make it easy to understand and also fun. And finally, during the elections, we also need to make sure that there's a strict quarantine barrier from the um, international side so that foreign money um, cannot buy domestic advertisements when it comes to the election season. And with all three, we're very happy to report that even during the pandemic, when the people's anxiety are the highest, we don't have society crippling conspiracy theories uh, and people remain very calm and collected uh, so that we can co-create our counter coronavirus without suffering from this infodemic. Um, and next, I would like to share something uh, that Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, um, our president, said during her first inauguration speech. She's on her second term now. But on the first term so inauguration speech, she says something that I consider very inspiring. She said, before we think of democracy as clash between opposing values, but now we need to think of democracy as conversation between many diverse values. And indeed in public uh, administration, there's many people who thought that the government is like this rope in between. For example, one side may be the economic sector want to develop industry, and the other side may be the people caring about the environment and the sustainability uh, and their were intention of, um, against each other, and it's the public servants in the middle that, that need to absorb all the tension. Or maybe one side are the innovators that would like to disrupt um, the society using their new AI um, inventions, uh, and the other side, of course, is people who care about social justice, about access to fair opportunity and so on, and who will then uh, want to regulate uh, these disruptive inventions. And again, the government would be in the middle. But um, previously, uh, when each innovation still have a person, a representative uh, speaking, uh, either as a leader of a union or a leader of a association, leader of a um, parliamentary group or so on, uh, that was manageable. But nowadays, as I said, the hashtag doesn't have a spokesperson. And so our participation officers need to use a different way to think about the governance when it comes to the digital age. And this is COGOV co-creative, collaborative governance. And <clears throat> what you're looking at here is my office, literally my office. 
is the Social Innovation Lab in Taipei City. It's uh, next to the Jianguo Flower Market, uh, and it's literally a park. We tore down all the walls so people can just walk in and enjoy um, the people working, for example, this public art uh, is the um, work of people with Down syndrome, with treatment differences. Turns out that when we look at the world, of course, we see data, where your data offices, of course, we see data, um, and then we see the mathematical structures and we see the physics and so on. But people with Down syndrome, they see um, the world as geometric, as topological connections. So when they draw out um, in their mind, uh, their uh, thought processes uh, into art, um, it's like Van Gogh's paintings. Suddenly people will feel very creative. And so instead of treating them as vulnerable groups of people, the social innovators in Taiwan make sure that a society can benefit from their unique perspective. And so uh, the Social Innovation Lab um, is basically the place where people can make sure that these kind of social innovation can amplify through this um, design of more than 12 ministries um, residing here. And also uh, every Wednesday, anyone can have 40 minutes of my time or um, a little bit shorter if you're walking. Uh, but um, all I ask is that we publish uh, as video or as a transcript of uh, after 10 days of co-editing everything that we have said. And so this kind of open innovation may show that when people from MIT, uh, I think this is a media lab project called Persuasive Electric uh, Vehicles or the PEV. Uh, and these PEV makers uh, went to me, uh, I think quite a few times uh, around three years ago, saying that minister, um, we have this electric vehicles that drives by itself, but we're not quite sure um, what, what they're good for. Uh, and like, sure, the Social Innovation Lab is a open space and you can just uh, put your PEVs here and see how the market, literally the Jianguo flower market, um, reacts to it. Well, so I was there um, many times. Uh, I remember a time where an elderly couple from the Jianguo flower market holding some orchid flowers um, in small pots uh, and asking me, Minister, what are you doing with these shopping carts? I'm like, these are not shopping carts. These are self-driving vehicles. You uh, hop on one, it drives you places. And they're like, well, they look like shopping carts. Uh, and they tried putting their uh, orchid flowers in it, in the basket, and it worked. And they said, oh, we don't need uh, a self-driving vehicle that drives us places. Um, ta Taipei has pretty good um, taxi and metro and other public transportation. But they say, well, in the Jianguo flower market, it's very crowded. We would like a shopping cart that follows us around so that we can do hands-free shopping, that we would just buy something, put it in the basket. And when it's full, uh, they heard about platooning. So it would step back and then invite something, um, another um, PEV, and form a fleet. Well, to uh, work with this kind of um, work, it need to look different. And so um, you see people from the MIT Media Lab um, I think that's filled in, uh, and yours truly, uh, trying out new designs in the Social Innovation Lab. It was the help of people um, uh, in the um, Taipei Tech that's just nearby. Because this is open source and open hardware, we were able then uh, to add on some eyes, um, and these eyes would show uh, other people who they are following, uh, who they are looking at, um, and to make it a much more pro-social, right, anti-social, like not a cyclop, uh, so that it will fit in with the rest of people in the Jango flower market and also in the social innovation lab. And this is what I call a norm-first innovation strategy. We make sure that we first include people in the real society, co-creating the norm on which that these PEVs um, can work with the society. And then we co-domesticate with the entire city. So nowadays, um, my grandma, uh, who's in her um, eight, 80s, um, actually just uh, told me that uh, she just tried a self-driving vehicle in New Taipei City, uh, and it worked really well. Uh, and the same thing that we learned from this uh, PEV 
uh, are also getting translated um, into the uh, bus that uh, works in the after midnight hours when metro stop working also in Taipei City. So there's dozens of sandbox experiments like this happening in Taiwan, always with a norm first uh, philosophy. In uh, Sustainable Development Goal SDG terms, that's target 1717, encouraging effective partnerships. So uh, every year we hold a annual presidential hackathon, making sure that people from all walks of life can amplify their ideas into national agenda. And the award of presidential hackathon is this micro projector. Each year we give out five to uh, domestic teams. We also have an international track, but for domestic teams, um, each recipient, when they turn on the micro projector, that is the trophy, there's no prize money, there's just this trophy. The trophy projects Dr. Tsai Ing-wen's image. The president herself uh, says, okay, whatever you have created in the past three months as a prototype, we promise that we will make it our national policy, our national direction in the next 12 months. So that's executive presidential power as a hackathon prize. And so there's many uh, innovations such as uh, these people from um, Taiwan Water Corporation using assistive intelligence or AI to make sure that they don't have to keep listening to the pipes that are not leaking. They can concentrate their time on the pipes that are actually leaking. And the machine learning, the deep learning, reduced uh, the time it takes to um, detect uh, leaking pipes from two months to two days. And there's also innovations such as for remote islands using telemedicine to make sure that instead of asking each um, time that uh, there's a serious like major trauma and so on uh, to fly via helicopter to the main Taiwan island, um, people in the, say, uh, Orchid Island um, can have a high bandwidth connection with the um, helicopter dispatch and also with the specialized doctor in the main Taiwan island and with the local doctor or nurse performing the instructions from the specialized doctors, they can win the trust from the local people, making sure that um, they are uh, trusted by the local people and they don't have to send every patient through helicopters. We also change our telemedicine laws for that. Or for example, um, people who care about, here you see air quality, water quality, and so on, can form data collaboratives that make sure that the citizen scientists can work with institutional scientists and share the same data service platform on our CI, um, civilioc.taiwan.gov.tw, so that if you go to uh, the ci.taiwan platform, you can see very clearly that um, people of um, social sector, economic sector, and the public sector are working on the same set of data to make sure not only that we can send advanced earthquake warnings uh, through SMS to the people who would likely be affected, we can also warn people um, who are going to be affected by a flood um, in an advanced warning before a typhoon hits and so on. And these, by the way, gets repurposed during the pandemic as the digital fence system that works with what people already understand, which is cell phone tower triangulation and SMS messages, rather than uh, forcing them to install an app or turn on the GPS. So again, we use the data collaborative that are trusted because it's co-created with civil society um, for counter pandemic purposes. And um, one of the most popular maps uh, from Fingen Qiang, Jiang Minzong in Tainan City was also um, basically repurposing this air quality map uh, to show mask availability. The air quality map you see here um, that went back quite a few years ago, um, all the thousands of points here are done by people who volunteer their schools, like primary school teachers, their balconies and so on, um, to measure like PM 2.5, the air quality, and share it to a distributed ledger so nobody can go in time to modify the records. And so the great thing about this is that, um, well, the more people are worried about air quality, the more people would then set up such inexpensive, less than 100 US dollar stations and the collaboratives that they form is democratically governed, it's making sure that they have the social mandate so they can talk 
to the environment minister saying, hey, um, we would like you to check our numbers and uh, calibrate the numbers, uh, making sure that our um, machines work in high humidity uh, days and so on. But in return, we would like you to fill in the gaps, the places around here uh, that doesn't have a uh, measurement device. Well, that was because these are industrial parks or private um, lands that, uh, of course, the primary school teachers cannot break and enter and install. Um, and so it turns out we own the lamp in those municipal governments, uh, as well as in the science parks, industrial parks. So we just use their design and then added such uh, weather stations, micro weather stations in the industrial areas. Again, contributing uh, like a puzzle um, from all the different sites to make sure that we not only educate our K-12 um, students in data stewardship, uh, which is very hard to teach from a consumer's perspective, but very easy if they start uh, running, operating their own air boxes. And the global citizenship and sustainable development like climate science is also a major um, curriculum item in Taiwan. And we also work with anyone across the world that decides to download the air box and run it locally on a Raspberry Pi or on a Arduino. And so each time, whenever we run a presidential hackathon, um, there's a lot of AI times CI um, or extended intelligence teams uh, that augments the collective intelligence um, into all sorts of different sustainable development goal targets. And where do we find the people uh, who want to propose such presidential hackathon uh, items? Well, we empower people who are closest to the pain. I personally, every other week or so, go to the most remote places, most rural indigenous lands, remote islands, and so on. And I go by myself and I join uh, their town halls and stay for a couple of days uh, on an ethnographic hangout uh, and uh, sometimes with uh, a cultural translator uh, for the indigenous language. There's more than 20 national language in Taiwan, uh, most of which indigenous. And we make sure that the people for them is just another town hall. But when I join the town hall, helping to facilitate, I bring with me um, all the 12 ministries, section chiefs or higher uh, from the social innovation lab in two way video conferencing. And so it makes sure that people who talk about things um, can be listened in its entirety in a context, ensuring responsive and inclusive decision-making because all the 12 ministries would then listen to the entire story instead of just a few abstractions. And whenever there's new ideas, like during the presidential hackathon, that need to uh, break existing regulations a little bit, we arrange a sandbox where they can do so for like um, three months, six months, or up to a year, and try their new forked version of the regulation. If it's a good idea, then it will become our regulation. If it's a bad idea, well, everybody learn a little bit. Again, in a risk-contained way, this is how we work um, to make sure that knowledge sharing and collaboration and science and innovation benefits the entire society. And finally, when I say it's a good idea, well, what is a good idea? For example, was UberX a good idea? Well, in 2015, we used the AI-powered conversation system, POLIS, which is now a part of Taiwanese government. There's polis.gov.tw, uh, a open source software becoming um, polis.gov.tw that shows uh, through k-means clustering uh, and pr principal um, dimension re reduction, the PCA, principal component analysis, making sure that everybody can see where they stand when it comes to the feeling part on the emerging technology. This is the actual map that we showed on the UberX case. And so we first present people with facts, open data from all sectors. And then we use police to ask people's feelings. There's no right or wrong for the same fact. I can feel happy, they can feel angry, and it's all okay. And after those uh, feelings gets resonating with each other, then we can say the best ideas are the idea that take care of people's feelings. And finally, we turn them into decisions. And so the experience of POLIS is like this. You can see one sentiment from your fellow citizen, like passenger liability insurance, very important for UberX. If you agree, you would move toward me a little bit. If you disagree, you will move um, um, afar. However, 
um, there's no reply button. So there's no point for trolling that you can't control uh, it without a reply button. So you can just share what you feel with each other. And after three weeks, we always get this picture. And this may be the most important picture of this entire hour of talk. Instead of the institutional and some antisocial social media would lead us believe that we live in a polarized world. Actually, most people agree with most of each other on most of the things most of the time. And this is not something about the Taiwanese culture. This picture I'm showing here is from Bowling Green, Kentucky. No matter people uh, who identify as Democrats or Republican, everybody agree that in addition to science, technology, engineering, and math, we need to add art to it. And so, I mean, this is such a um, simple consensus, but if the uh, people really care about it, using polis, they can discover that we're not that different from each other after all. And that is the basis of the democratic policy. So we further develop the measurement of progress, our KPI is set by the crowd using an API. So uh, finally, I would like to share with you uh, my job description. As you um, can see from my presentation, I'm more of a innovation space in the middle that would enable people who care about different sustainable development goals to co-create common values and deliver innovation that moves these values forward. And in SDG terms, these are reliable data, 1718, effective partnerships, 1717, and open innovation, 176. And when I became the digital minister four years ago, um, the SDGs were really new. Uh, and so the HR department asked me to translate these uh, into plain English. And that's my job description. I will read it to you now as a conclusion. When we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you for listening. One, I would appreciate it if you can give advice to young people who want to create and nurture a company that would continue to grow and develop forever, respecting the independence and responsibility of each employee whose mission is to contribute to society from the three perspectives of ethics, entrepreneurship, and strategy. For the first question, um, I don't think there's any company that can grow and develop forever. On the other hand, the idea of sustainability is about prospering in the current generation while leaving the next generation with a better environment to prosper. So, in my opinion, the most important part about ethics is intergenerational solidarity. Whenever we're making a decision with a company, we can ask not only ourselves, but all our stakeholders, is this going to leave a world a better place one, two, seven generations down the line? And that is the perspective that I usually take, which is the perspective of being a good ancestor. Now about entrepreneurship. Indeed, for many young people, Starting a new business is a way of self-expression. Maybe you have identified a global trend that nobody around you have identified. Maybe you want to right a injustice. Maybe you want to leave the environment in a better way without sacrificing economy. No matter which innovation uh, you have brought to the world, keep in mind that there's no, strictly speaking, success or failure as an individual. If we pursue the triple bottom line idea, that is to say, to foster economic prosperity while making the society a more just place, while making environments more sustainable, then probably we cannot fail on all three bottom lines. And so while making the business work on any of the bottom line is important, also as important is to pivot as quickly as possible if somehow you did not match the other two bottom lines. So entrepreneurship is not just about changing the world, it's also about changing with 
the world, to let the world also change you and show you the better way from the various series of pivoting. And so in order to realize the strategy, I usually make sure that there is a cross-sectoral partnership. The social sector is really good at creating norms of shaping what's normal in the society. The business sector is good for scaling out those norms, making sure that there is a market so that people from various different places in the world can also get access to the insight that's brought forward by those norms. So what's for the public sector to do? What's the government's role in all this? In my mind, I call myself a public servant for the public service. That is to say, our role is to amplify those norms and wherever there's any tension, there's any clashes between the norm and the existing market or the other way around. Instead of pursuing zero-sum regulations, we always co-create possible solutions that is the result of innovation. That's everyone's business with everyone's help. So social innovation, think of your customers not as users, but your co-creators. Think of regulators, not just your supervisors, but your co-creators, your business partners, also your co-creators. That is the main strategy I would advise you to pursue in this hyper-connected global world. Two, I feel that in order to change society for the better, we have to wait until the generation of ministers and others is gone, and it becomes our generation. This is unavoidable because that the older generation and the younger generation want and think differently. But I feel that this is one of the reasons why various things such as digitalization and gender issues are not progressing. If our generations come to run the society 40 years from now, the youth of that time will probably feel the same way. Therefore, I think that uh, we will not be able to break free from this negative cycle. Do you have any thoughts on how to break out of this negative cycle and how to relate to the older generations and the younger generation? The key to intergenerational solidarity is to think of the senior people as also youth. They were young ones. All of them remember being young, with no exception, actually. So because of that, they also remember the feeling of innovation, the feeling of breaking through, the feeling of uh, fostering a new social norm that the senior people simply don't understand. So on a meta level, all the senior people currently in power remember how it feels to be young. And so as someone who's exactly 40 years old, kind of in the midpoint, uh, in the life expectancy, uh, I believe that we need more bridges. We need more experiences that translates um, today's youngsters, for example, the e-sport um, that we helped facilitating into a new regulation. We redefined e-sport during the discussion, saying that Go, uh, Weizi, um, the Game of Stones, is also an e-sport. Now, there's many senior people in the Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of Education who have played Go as a young person, maybe to the detriment uh, to their school credits uh, when, when they were young. And then, nowadays, they understand, oh, this game, turn-based video game, is now being played uh, more or less exclusively now over the internet. It's a spectator spot that the vast majority of spectators learn about it through the internet. So uh, during the training, during the competition itself, and so on, especially during the pandemic, uh, it is a e-sport. And so they then uh, also understand better than other turn-based e-sports. And from that moment on, they also understand real-time strategy games and other e-sports. So without asking them to go away, to leave the space to the young people, we simply reminded them when they were young and also feel passionately about a board game, right? So uh, I think this is the key to intergenerational solidarity. It's just to remind the senior youth that they also were youth and also are young in mind. Three, 
I cannot have confidence if this is really the way I should go. As you drop out of junior high school at the age of fourteen and you went into the internet society, how did you make such a decision? Today, as coronavirus makes it difficult to predict the future, I tend to make a low-risk choice and choose the way I can get marketable skills. I think I will regret such choices in the future. Can you tell us the key of decision making in your life? In a sense, the coronavirus makes it easier to predict the future. Digital transformation in many corners of the world was not a done deal. It was not a、um, collaboratively agreed upon direction before the coronavirus, but the pandemic served. As a great accelerator that we can see in the corners that are digitalized, and all in digitalization means digitalized for all, they survive and thrive during the pandemic, and in the places that were not as digitalized, not as、um, applied with equity, then、uh, it was under tremendous pressure that have they have to digitally transform almost overnight, and so. At the age of fourteen, I also witnessed Taiwan's democratization.、Uh, I participated、um, in the first presidential campaign,、uh, the 1996 presidential election, where Taiwanese people voted for the president directly for the first time. And so, it was also a time of change, much like how the pandemic changed today's outlook on digital.、Uh, democracy also changed. How the coaches in Taiwan view ourselves. Previously, we were defined in many ways, but there's a top-down cultural、uh, narrative that people have to conform. But after democratization, suddenly diversity and inclusion is not a bad thing. It's not out of norm. It is not abnormal. Rather, it becomes the strength of the Taiwanese culture. So much so that I call our country a transcultural republic of citizens. And so, at the age of fourteen, I let the norm, the culture of internet, guide me, so that instead of making a decision as an individual, I make decisions as part of a community that discovered ourselves, asserted ourselves, and our cultures on the internet. So that's why I always insist that digitalization is about connecting people to people. It's not just IT which connects machines to machines. So. In order to make no regrets, I would invite you to find communities、uh, that shares your passion, that fa- shares the fairness and the fun of creation. And then, even if you get marketable skills, then it's not just for yourself, but rather to advance the culture of the communities that you identify. And before long, instead of being considered a subculture, well, you will define the culture. The future will come to realize through your. Culture. Four, regional revitalization is regarded as important in both Taiwan and Japan. Under such circumstances, I heard that in Taiwan, efforts are being made to eliminate educational disparities by developing 5G first in the rural areas. I think it would be good if there were a framework for cooperation at the government level and the citizen level that could share the results of each other's efforts between the two countries that was originally in a friendly relationship and still are. I must add, what kind of examples can be considered? Um, I'm really glad to share that Japan, along with the U.S. and Taiwan, are the three co-hosts of the GCTF, the Global Cooperation and Training Framework, upon which that we share such advances, along with the other host countries that identify also with the democratization of technologies. And so, in the like-minded countries, we also share, for example, how on how applying 5G to counter the pandemic. The infodemic to tackle the sustainable circular economy to make sure that we all move toward decarbonization and net zero、uh, in our planning and so on. So there is already a vibrant community. So I would invite you to consider checking out the GCTF and its various、uh, subpanels,、uh, where we have a what we call mini lateral. So it's like multilateral, but with fewer country at a time. Thematic areas、uh, that you can contribute in, and also、uh, I would 
uh, encourage you to check out the Presidential Hackathon. Uh, it's a event in Taiwan where each year we also invite people to contribute toward the global issues. And this year we focus on climate action. So if you have any ideas about how to tackle climate action using novel database solutions, that is also a great way to basically win a trip to Taiwan and spend some time with not just our presidential office, but also with our social sector, our business sector, who are also now just figuring how to reach uh, net zero as committed also by Japan. Five, I hear that in Taiwan, there is a relationship of trust between the government and people regarding the handling of personal information. On the other hand, there is data that many people in Japan that think that the government can no longer be trusted. How can we build a relationship of trust between the government and people like Taiwan in town development? To give no trust is to get no trust. The reason why many people in Taiwan trusted, say, the National Health Insurance Administration with our health information is because the NHI also trusts each of us. With an app that has been downloaded by more than half of the population, the Zhong, the NHI app, people can, with a glance, see all the doctor visits, dentist visits, x-ray scans that could be downloaded, vaccination, you name it, and this is a shared um, data store that each of us know for sure that will not be used for commercial purposes uh, without our explicit authentication and authorization. Many people use the serial number on the national health card to file taxes. Nowadays, in the internet-based tax filing system, people use that much more than card readers. So just using a mobile ID, a SMS number, as well as the serial number of the National Health Court, again, people can just file their taxes. I did so myself in just six minutes. M many people less. I have more to calculate. But anyway, the idea is that the convenience and the idea that everyone is the owner of the information that they produce, that we are all data stewards, that can guard against the data bias and form data coalitions by our own volition. This is very empowering. So that when people understand they can opt out at any time from any data collection, or they can opt in to any research, for example, the Taiwan Biobank, uh, that furthers the common public health, um, and so on, people understand the choice is in ourselves. However, if the government offers no choice, or the government offers the choice, but the citizens did not get the full picture of what those choice entails, then trust is easily lost. Which is why we made sure that in Taiwan, for example, during the counter-pandemic times, there's daily press conferences that the health offices answers each and every question exactly as demanded by the journalists, with no exception, and the press conference did not end until all the journalists run out of questions. Uh, and this went on daily. And this has a far-reaching effect because people understand if they point out the problems, if they point out anything that's wrong, a mistake uh, by the CECC, the CECC will not blame the journalists or blame the citizens for pointing out the mistakes. Rather, uh, the Health and Welfare Minister Chen Shizhong always uh, showed competence by saying, hey, this is a very good question. Um, it has a lot of merits in it, and promptly we'll fix it tomorrow or at latest next Thursday. Right? So because of that, a very short iteration may show that people are incentivized to bring out even more of their expertise when asking questions because they understand there is a symmetry of attention. If uh, they took five minutes to write a question, then the health officer would spend at least five minutes to tackle the question. And this also uh, is the case if people call into the toll-free number 1922, more than 2 million calls last year. Again, you don't have to be a journalist to call in and effect real change. So a bi-directional, indeed uh, multi-directional communication apparatus that enables listening, not just hearing, listening at scale. This is the most important part. Six, would it be possible to mention about a case where an apparent failure eventually led you to a success? Certainly. 
Um, in the talk, you heard about the mask rationing map. Well, in the first day last February,、um, February six, where people started to access the mask rationing map, it worked really well to reduce unnecessary queuing, but only in some places in Taiwan. In some other places, such as in a pharmacy near my residence, it failed spectacularly. The reason is that the pharmacists at the time also adopted a social innovation of their own, and we didn't know about it beforehand. They handed out those small number plates cards、uh, in exchange of the national health cards. So instead of processing the health card and handing out the mask as rationed,、uh, they advised the people queuing in the morning to leave the cards there in exchange for the numbers and go back in the evening. Uh, so that they can go about doing their uh, pharmacy uh, drug dispensing business during the daytime. Now they process all the health IC cards during the lunch break. So on the mask map, it will look as if that they sell nothing for many hours, and then during the lunch breaks, everything is sold, and then run out of stock. However, during the morning time, if anyone look at the mask map and determine that this pharmacy has a lot of mask and go there. Well, they will、uh, see a very large banner that says "Don't trust the app." That's actually the case in the pharmacy near me、uh, because they have already run out of the, the, the reserve numbers. It's just that the、uh, information is not transmitted to the National Health Insurance Administration. On the other hand,、uh, many people at that point will say, "Okay, you have to choose one side or the other. You either choose to side with the pharmacist." In which case, there is no mask map anymore.、Uh, we will instead of release thirty seconds、uh, as a batch, as an interval, we will release every day at the end of the day a single number. Or you can side with the civic technologist and ban the use of take a number system at the pharmacies. But that will obviously lead to even more catastrophic failure. So we didn't do anything like that. Instead, I walked straight into the pharmacy, and asked the pharmacist this key question. If you are the digital minister, I asked, what would you do? And they thought about it for a day or two, and many suggestions came forward. We can, for example, on the mask map, list two different time slots: one for collecting numbers, one for collecting the mask. Eventually, a pharmacist suggested to me that we should introduce a button that they can just click and disappear from the map for the day, so they would do so soon as the number ran out, and so on. So we made many small changes like this over three iterations. But after three weeks, well, it's resolved and it's eventually led to a co-creating success. So leaving no one behind and taking all the sides is the moral from this story that can actually turn a apparent failure not into showdown between opposing values, but rather realizing that getting three quarters of people access to mask is the same value that's shared by all stakeholders here. We can co-create new mechanisms that will lead to the success. Seven, I'm a major in life sciences. In, at a university, digital technology, which Miss Audrey is good at, has recently influenced people through smartphones and other devices, and seems that、like、it is often featured in the news. So, what is important for fields such as life science to work with non-researchers to solve social problems? If you give me an answer, I would like to use it for my future research.、Um, in Taiwan, the life scientists enjoy, of course, a very high social status. But during the pandemic, what's the most important is that, for example, our VP Chen Jianren at the time,、um, an author of the textbook on epidemiology, became a YouTuber, recorded popular massive online open courses, to make sure that everybody understand what's the basic reproduction number, the R value, what is the、uh, technology behind contact tracing, why does masks work, why. Does vaccine work, and so on, and so I think one of the main issue that many scientific fields has with non-researchers is this issue of scientific communication. All too often, that when we think of a great way to solve social problems, if we lack the words to translate that into something that people can identify with and understand, then this innovation will not break through, and people will become afraid of technologies. So in my field,、um, that is to say, computer science, there is a lot of work involved in getting the people, even very young people, understand the basic of design thinking, 
of computational thinking, of、um, a Lego brick-like programming language, Scratch, that's used by many primary school people、uh, in Taiwan. So people who are very young, just like playing Lego blocks,、uh, and they understand how to assemble the pieces together. They can play Scratch and understand how to assemble things together, and then therefore gains the main insight, which is in the computer science field. Very rarely do people code things、uh, from the blank canvas. On the other hand, almost all of us just assemble existing ideas and modules,、uh, code that's already done in the open on open innovation spaces such as GitHub. And then, if we need to make something new, we often make it in the open so that with many eyes, all bugs are shallow and people can point out the shortcomings of our thoughts and so on. And so this open innovation norm, where people, even the primary school people, start with a video game they want to、uh, play with, and then they discover it's done by a fellow primary schooler, and they can change how the hero、uh, looks like, and they can change、um, how the music or the color、um, feels like, and so on. And so they begin programming <clears throat> without thinking themselves as engineers. Rather, this is more like a contributor designer. Where people improve on each other's design, so I'm sure that life sciences can adopt a similar approach. People can learn through interactive games, through card games even,、uh, and learn exactly how life sciences work, and become not necessarily life scientists, but understand how to view ourselves,、um, the life on Earth, and so on, through the lens of the life sciences. So instead of Uh, saying that we need to solve social problems, maybe one of the main ways to work with non-researchers is to communicate across the different disciplines, so that the society can point out the current issues and work on solving the problems together, not for the people, with the people, and eventually after the people. Eight. I think Ms. Audrey Tang has taken various actions so far, but I would like you to teach me the techniques and attitudes to put your own ambitions into practice. Well, as I mentioned in a previous question, my ambition is to become public servant to the public service. So it means that to serve with equity, the people who serve other people. With equity, this is very meta,、uh, and this attitude also enables me to take all the sides whenever the various ministries, which represent their own very distinct cultures and values, to think about co-creation. Now the techniques are many: open space technology, non-violent communication, dynamic facilitation. These are just some of the social technologies that we just deploy、um, from a day-to-day -day basis. But the attitude is always the same. It's getting the shared values from different positions, and then creating new things that everybody can live with, that fosters those shared values. So one is about listening, and one is about expressing. But the expressing and the listening part work like diamonds. So on the exploration part, people get their various innovations based on a shared idea. And then we listen to what the stakeholders say about those innovations. There may be no consensus. Maybe it's just a rough consensus or a good enough consensus of how the society should move after this. But then we got this、uh, good enough consensus, and then we can make even more new things that、uh, feeds back to the stakeholders that in the initial listening session. And so just keep doing this, and then your own ambitions. Will interweave with other people's ambitions, so that each creates the preconditions upon which that other people's amb ambitions can foster. And so, in mathematical terms, I often think of it as a conflict-free, replicable data type, or CRDT, that enables, for example, when we're sharing a spreadsheet together, like either Calc or a document together, like、uh, HackMD or Google Docs.、Um, The computer science、uh, concept of CRDT enables us to transform our operations so that a lot of people can type in the same time with various degree of、uh, network connectivity, but the result is never in conflict. 
eventual consistency means that people come to agree on a good enough consensus of how the document should look like in the final place without any single person playing the role of a dictator, of a arbiter. And so that is uh, my attitude, working with the public service to serve the public. Nine, when thinking about future town development, I think it would be important to listen to the voices of residents, that is, public opinions with the power of the digital. On the other hand, there are concerns that digital divide may create new inequities and disparities. If you have any hints for achieving digital democracy while avoiding it, please let us know. The basic idea is to bring technology to the people and never ask people to conform to technology. When we're digitalizing our services, this is augmenting, not replacing face-to-face -face interactions. When we're digitalizing the public service for tax volume, for example, I just pointed out that people can finish that in six minutes. But if people want to uh, meet someone over the counter, if they want to go to the Ministry of Finance, we're not taking that away. We're empowering the people on the desk, the public service staff, with the kind of augmented assistive intelligence that empowers them to tackle the most common issues that the people who want to file tax uh, can bring forward. We make sure that when people are holding town halls, we listen to the people in their town halls that uh, they are already familiar with. We're not asking them to type into a inconvenient website or something. Uh, we're not asking them to travel all the way to Taipei City. Uh, they remain where they are. Uh, they hold the town halls exactly as they used to. It's just that with uh, professional facilitation, uh, with live streaming, sometimes 360 live streaming, we make sure that people in very different spaces, for example, the central government, all the different ministries in the social innovation lab can feel that they are in the same room as the more senior people in the rural places uh, or in the remote islands. And so the digital connection brings spaces together, but they do not exclude people from the spaces that I already uh, mentioned that people get this familiarity with. So when we're introducing the mask rationing and so on, we're not asking people to use, uh, for example, mobile payments or other ways to realize real name uh, rationing. Rather, we deliberately chose the pharmacies because the pharmacists are the ones trusted by the communities the most. And also the senior people already know how to bring their national health costs to um, continue their recurring prescriptions for chronic conditions. Actually, they know that um, better than the younger uh, family members. So often younger family members give the senior people uh, the health cards for a day so that they can help getting the mask together. And when we design the convenience stores, um, mask pre-ordering, we deliberately shaped it, including the coin payment option, the same as the pharmacies. So I hope those anecdotes show that bringing technology to where people are, meeting people where the people are, empowering people closest to the pain are the design principles to make sure that we can achieve a digital democracy without creating new inequities. 10. It's often said that using digital will improve people's quality of life. Is that true? Will war, poverty, and discrimination disappear if 5G and AI develop? Rather, isn't there a risk of expanding them? As long as these aspects don't disappear, I don't think we can say our quality of life has really improved. What do you think about it? I, I don't think 5G or AI is by itself um, a solution provider for war, poverty, or the problem of discrimination. As you correctly pointed out, AI actually makes waging wars um, even less expensive uh, for many war planners. And AI also carries the possibility of a bias, of a discrimination uh, that is more systemic than any norm or culture-based discrimination. On the other hand, if we develop AI toward the idea of assistive intelligence, that is to say, empowering individual citizens, then whenever they face discrimination, as I mentioned, the autonomy of the data, uh, individual sovereignty, will make sure that people can point out this discrimination 
much more easily based on the evidence. And also, it, the solution to this discrimination is also more um, um, possible, it's also more convenient if people can solve discrimination without actually a mass scale uh, social struggle. I think about, for example, during the mass rationing, um, MP Gao Hong pointed out that uh, the rural places, even though on the map, measured by the kind of helicopter distance, uh, each individual is uh, subject to roughly the same opportunity of getting the mask. However, the rural places, if people rely on public transportation, then the time opportunity cost, which is not reflected on the shape of the map, um, is actually much higher. So that so uh, when people go to the pharmacy using public transportation in more remote places, maybe the pharmacy have already closed. And so there is a bias, a kind of city bias, Taipei bias, um, when we just look at the map uh, without thinking too much about it. On the other hand, because the MP pointed out as part of her interpolation, um, the minister Chen Shizhong simply said, well, legislator teach us. And then we began the co-creation, which is only possible with this assistive intelligence approach. And we introduced pre-ordering and we changed how the distribution is made. So uh, a good feedback system that makes sure that people who are closest to the suffering caused by AI is also the most uh, potent to suggest uh, solutions to the bias. That actually has the possibility of correcting the bias uh, that like the CD mm, Taipei bias inherent in many policymakers' mind uh, in a much more uh, powerful way uh, than the traditional way of education, which, of course, need to wait far longer for people to uh, think about um, the rural places in a way that's not um, capital city based. So uh, I think this goes hunt to hunt. This is not about replacing education. Education facilitates learning. That's still the most important. But AI can assist this education by making the data biases, by making the drawbacks, uh, by making the inequities um, more widely seen to the people. And 5G, for example, can also bring uh, video conferencing and live streaming, uh, this idea of co-presence uh, away from the uh, over-concentrated cities and into the more rural places, the remote islands and so on, so that people in the large cities, the decision makers for the country, can also feel that they uh, are kind of intertwined uh, with the faiths, with the current sufferings uh, in the more remote places uh, and so on, so that we can all feel this in a more holistic way. And so I, I don't think digital uh, connecting people to people magically improve quality of life. But if people who are connected this way care about each other, then uh, sooner or later we will find ways that improve each other's quality of life. So communication between people and people is just the beginning. But if we don't facilitate this communication, again, there is also a risk of isolation, polarization, uh, stereotyping, and so on. So we need to develop technologies, but not as industrial only. There also need to be a social aspect to the technologies. And I sincerely um, invite you to think about democracy itself as a form of technology that we can work on. And then 5G and AI are just the instruments upon which that we can build a more inclusive digital democracy. Last but not the least, I would like to extend my appreciation to TMU for inviting me. I understand that TMU strives to create an environment that fosters leaders who contribute to industries and communities globally. So it's my great pleasure to virtually meet you. You're the potential leaders of the future who I believe will play important roles in contributing to the many common values that we share and ensure a bright society and future. So thank you and live long and prosper.